Um, all right, so we are analyzing the cylindrical pressure vessel. We've reached the result associated with the tangential stress. So now what I will do is I will take a slightly different cut. So I will take uh, another cut from which we will be able to deduce the value for the axial stress. Okay, and I will take that cut coming back to that picture. Remember there were closed ends and these are ultimately uh, hemispherical caps. And I'm going to take a cut. Okay. Um, that looks like this and I'm going to draw the free body diagram of this, of that portion. Okay, so presently, just for simplicity, we're going to assume uh, to comfort ourselves that those caps are hemispherical to, to, to simplify my picture um, a little bit. Okay, so this is the part that I'm going to draw a free body diagram of. So let's do that. So we will have a... just the hemispherical cap portion. I've just cut off the tip of the, hemis the cylindrical pressure vessel. This is where I took the cut, chopped off the hemispherical cap, and the hemispherical cap is a geometry that looks like this. Now, inside the hemispherical cap, there is pressure, okay, that is acting normal to the surfaces at every point on the inside of the hemispherical vessel. That direction is the axial direction. Let me indicate for convenience presently that along that line, I'm picking the positive direction to be X. Irrespect is it's, it's inconsequential to our results. In fact, it is consistent with our analysis. So the pressure is going to push, push the uh, cap, the hemispherical cap, along the minus x direction and there needs to form internal stresses or forces that ultimately resist that and what will resist it is stresses, normal stresses forming on the surface where I take a cut okay. and those stresses are normal stresses that are on the plane with normal x in the direction x so they are going to be axial uh, stresses so at this point, I've just lost um, light due to the fact that electricity, I believe, has run out. I'm just going to wait for a second to see if it comes back, actually, um, and continue, hoping that you can see a little bit. So um, we have resisting stresses. There you go. Um, essentially acting to resist the pressure, in other words, giving rise to equilibrium. Um, so all I need to do is go ahead and write equilibrium in the direction x. So that is the positive direction associated with x. Some of the forces in the x direction need to be equal to zero. So some of the forces are equal to, um, first of all, the forces associated with the internal stresses sigma x they are distributed over a thin-walled area. I'm assuming that that distribution is uniform. That's the thin-walled assumption, just like I did for the um, tangential stress. And so I just need to multiply it by the thin-walled area, which is simply because it's thin-walled, again, another level of assumption on the area, simply the circumference 2 pi r times the thickness. Okay. Uh, all right. So then the resist, the, the, this stress is resisting the pressure force that's acting on the cap. So now the argument that I made for that net force for the tangential stress was intrinsically 2D. Now here there's a three-dimensional cap geometry, but the argument still applies. When I look along the extraction, the shadow of this cap along the x direction, if I look in that direction, it's simply going to be a circle. And the pressure is acting at every point, yes, normal to the surface, and that normal is in 3D in different directions, but its shadow 
is going to have an area of size radius squared pi, pi r squared, right? Um, so in other words, the shadow, the projection of this, comp this hemispherical cap along the x-axis is simply pi r squared. So by the same argument, all I need to put in here is simply pressure times pi r squared. The thickness is irrelevant and uh, ultimately the length is also irrelevant. It's already of the of units of area. It's correct. And of course, again, by the same argument, if this had some irregular shape, still the net force along the extraction would have been pi r squared. And that now needs to be equal to zero. And hence, I find that sigma x is equal to PR, right, over, now there's a factor of two, unlike the case of the tangential stress, it's PR over 2T, okay? Um, some immediate remarks. So we here, we had assumed that it was closed ends. If the pressure vessel is open-ended, there are no caps to consider. It is open-ended, so without taking a cut, it's already going to look like this. In that case, there is nothing that resists the pressure along the axis, axial direction. And in fact, the pressure in the axial direction, its effect in the axial direction becomes irrelevant. There is no such effect. You will see problem examples where such cases occur. And therefore, that is a case, it's called a case that is open-ended open-ended and with open ends you don't generate axial stresses because there is nothing that holds the vessel together along that direction the pressure is free to or the fluid is free to move if you like and therefore sigma x would be taken to be zero so if you see a problem depiction with open-ended pressure vessel then you don't consider axial stresses they are zero from the outset you only have um, tangential stresses. So that's the first remark that I'd like to make. The second remark that I'd like to make is uh, going to address a spherical pressure vessel geometry. So here met, let's make a note. If I had a spherical pressure vessel, so which would be simply a sphere, of course, it would again have some wall thickness, a radius and a wall thickness. So then, uh, what I'd like to do is, I'd like to look at the stresses that form within the structure. And by the same argument, I could take different cuts. In the cylindrical case, I took a axial cut, and I took a, in this case, also a axial cut, and the previous one had to do with a tangential cut. So, and that revealed two different pictures. One picture, looked like this, the other picture looked like that, okay? One in the axial direction, the other one in the other direction, and two different pictures. But if I have a pressure vessel that is of a spherical shape, no matter how I cut it, so for instance, I can cut it like this, or I can cut it like that. No matter how I cut it, I will always see the same picture. So for instance, for that one, I'm going to see a picture that's going to, if I take the left piece, I'm going to see a picture that looks like this. Okay, so where I took a cut is this wall thickness. Okay, so it's just this picture flipped reverse in some manner. And if I look at that piece after I take this cut, I am going to see a picture that looks like this. Okay, again, there is a wall thickness. This is where I took the cut. And therefore, no matter how you cut it, you can always see the same picture, which is equivalent to that picture. In other words, all directions are like axial directions, or more correctly stated, let's think about the coordinate system that we have here. In the cylindrical coordinate system, we have a radial direction. Here still we have a radial direction that comes from the center extend outwards. And then in the cylindrical case, we had a tangential direction that moved around 
one tangential direction here as well. And let's call that in this case T1, the first tangential direction. Typically, you would call that, say, theta. And in the spherical case, the other direction is not an axial direction. There is no axial direction. There is no well-defined direction to a sphere. It's just another tangential direction. And so the second direction is also a tangential direction. That's called T2. And in a spherical coordinate system, you would call that phi. So in other words, you end up with two tangential stresses. In one picture, you would calculate a sigma theta, if you like. In the other case, you would calculate a sigma phi. But both of them are equal, and I'm just going to call it sigma t, and that sigma t is going to be equal to, by the analysis of the same similar picture, pr over 2t. So that's an end to our long, uh, rather long remark. So to summarize, in a spherical pressure vessel, there are two tangential directions, sigma t1 and sigma t2 both of which are the same and they have a value of PR over 2t in terms of the stress value. And notice that in all of these expressions, P is internally pressurized is positive and therefore sigma x is positive, sigma t is positive and indeed they have to be so because they are the stresses that are generated in the material to hold the material together, to avoid the pressure rupturing this thing apart, right? If it were compressive, in other words, if it were externally pressurized, sigma x would be negative because p would be negative. And in that case, the pressure on the outside is trying to compress the uh, sphere, is trying to crush it, and the stresses, normal stresses that are generated, resisted by through compressive stresses themselves. So they would be negative, right? So in a spherical pressure vessel, two tangential stresses, both of them are the same. Remember, there are two directions, PR over 2T, both of them is eventually important. In a cylindrical case, there is one that is axial PR over 2T, the other one is PR over T, the tangential one. Tangential is, um, the direction is changing, the magnitude is changing, depending on whether it's spherical or cylindrical. So. Presently, we are comparing, we're working on a cylindrical case, but let's compare the stresses for spherical versus cylindrical. In spherical, both of them are PR over 2T. We're not even discussing the sigma R. That's going to be the same for both. And on the other hand, the, in the cylindrical case, there is one, the axial one, which is PR over 2T, and the tangential one in a cylindrical case is PR over 2T, which is twice as high as that one, right? So we can imagine ultimately that if the stresses are larger, the stress, the situation is going to be more critical with respect to a failure analysis that we're going to start discussing uh, in, in not the next topic, but the topic after that. So therefore, we can already see and suspect that if we have extremely high pressures, you may want to reduce the stresses by, instead of choosing a cylindrical vessel, a spherical vessel, in which case the stresses are significantly less. In particular, one component is not PR over 2T, but actually both of them uh, are PR over 2T. Okay? So spherical pressure, in some sense, is a more optimal scenario for uh, carrying highly pressurized uh, gas. Okay, now... Moving beyond this long note, let's finally look at the last remaining piece of the puzzle, which is the normal stress associated with the radial direction. Again, remember what we're doing. We have three coordinate directions. It doesn't have, it can be r, theta, phi, it can be r, t, um, x, or it can be x, y, z, 1, 2, 3, a, b, c, doesn't matter. Three directions, we're in 3D we will have three normal stresses. I found two of them. I'm seeking the third one that has to do with the radial direction. Now, remember what the radial direction is doing. If I zoom on to a portion of the wall, okay, on the inside, we have a pressure acting on the surface, compressing it. On the outside, there is nothing. Let's assume there is nothing. It's zero. Um, so, therefore, um, the radial direction, which is this direction,
is going to have a normal stress associated with it because the normal to any point is the radial direction. This is also a radial direction. This is also a radial direction. And on the radial direction, there is a stress that is compressive and it's, uh, it's of magnitude P, right? I'm compressing and it's of magnitude P. And that's on the inside. So sigma R is equal to minus to indicate that it's compressive and the value is P on inside. And if I move outside, the stress is going to go to zero because outside, the way I denoted it presently, it is free. And therefore, on the outside, it's zero. We've discussed already that a free surface has no normal stress on it. And for that matter, no shear stress on it. So it's zero on the, I'm sorry, outside. Um, so, that's the variation of sigma r. Unlike the others, I cannot, even for a thin wall setting, omit the variation of sigma r because certainly it is not zero on the inside and it is zero on the outside. However, remember that we are working with the case of a thin wall vessel. So, if you look at this value, for instance, it is p over 2, r over t t over r is very small or r over t is very, very large. So if the ratio is, in our case, is 300, okay, so p versus that is of the order of 100. So sigma s is magnitudes larger, two orders of magnitudes larger than sigma r, and so is sigma t. It's going to be two orders of magnitude larger than sigma r, which means that for most practical analysis purposes, even the one on the inside can also be omitted and taken to be zero. Now, I put this with a big caveat. Sometimes for analysis purposes, just for comparison, or sometimes for some practical purpose, we may want to take that value to be not zero, but say minus p. In the context of this example and many of the examples that we're going to solve involving pressure vessels, we're going to take that value to be zero, and that's safe as long as it is a quite thin-walled um, setting, all right? Um, so finally now we have the three coordinates, the three normal stresses associated with the three directions, and now we want to go ahead and calculate the um, strains from the stresses because if I go back to my solution scheme, I have from the laws derived the normal stresses, now I can go to strains and hence deduce the deformation from those stresses. And that's now what I would like to do. Again, because it's a long problem, I'm going to pause here and continue immediately.